So you're a smart business committed to innovation, to service and to modern marketing. And you're asking, what's next? Wondering how you can become even more innovative. My name is Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz and this is the InnovaBuzz podcast where we share all kinds of tips, advice and interview guests on all things innovation and leadership in modern marketing. Hi Innovators, it's great to be back. I hope you've had an awesome week so far. I'm really excited today to have on the InnovaBuzz podcast as my guest, Steve Killalay, the founder and executive chairman of Integrated Research Limited, the Charitable Foundation, and the Institute for Economics and Peace. He's the creative force behind the Global Peace Index study, the world's leading measure of peacefulness. We talked about how developing metrics to measure peace helps to move the world closer to a peaceful existence. The analogy of studying healthy rather than sick people to understand health, so studying peaceful nations to understand peace is the underlying principle of the Global Peace Index and the idea of positive peace and the economic benefits of peace rather than excessive spending on weapons and defence capability, invest in health, education and in-country infrastructure, which all directly benefit the local and global economy. Without further ado then, let's fly into the hive and get the buzz from Steve Killalay. Hi, I'm Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz and I'm really excited to have with me on the InnovaBuzz podcast today from Sydney in Australia, Steve Killalay. Steve's got over 30 years experience in the information technology industry and he's highly skilled in a whole range of areas. But what we want to talk about today is his philanthropic activities. First, he established the Charitable Foundation and then the Institute for Economics and Peace and the Global Peace Index, which is associated with that. So there's a lot to talk to Steve about. I'm really looking forward to where this conversation goes today. So welcome to the podcast, Steve. Oh, thanks, Jürgen. Very good to be here. It's a privilege to have you on the Innova Buzz podcast. And we have to shout, give a shout out to Jill Hicks of Mad for Peace, who suggested we speak to you. So hello to Jill. Okay. Thanks, Jill. I'm glad you put us all in contact. <laughs> All right. Um, so before we start talking about peace initiatives and charities that you're running and also leadership and innovation in, in your business and how that transferred over into your charitable foundations, let's find out a bit more about you as a person. I know you had a kind of an interesting story and, and started out um, not really wanting to go into IT as such, right? Uh, I think originally in life I uh, left school fairly early actually and what I was interested in at that stage was surfing so I probably <laughs> the latter part of my teens and the early part of my 20s surfing and went to many many interesting places I surfed a lot of Indonesia when it was still fairly well undiscovered and that, that was some of the adventures of my life I can remember I used to stay with the Indonesian family and I'd pay them 40 cents a, a day for the room and then I could live on 20 cents a day for the food and so that gave me a real insight actually into just how the poor actually live and what was one of those things I always take away I can remember one time there it was the, uh, the moving into the uh, you know, winter with not really a winter like we know it but see one of the members of the household got a cold just a, a head cold and everyone in the house got really fearful because evidently Carl's over there can kill people. Uh, mm. so any sickness, because the lack of medicine just could be fatal. Whereas in the West, we get sick, we got the money, we go along to a doctor and we, we get fixed up. And that was probably my first insight into just how needy a lot of the poor in the world really are. Mm. So did you kind of have visions early on of doing something to give back to society in general and help help those people that are less privileged than we are in the West? Well, I think I always had a uh, altruistic intent to some degree because I can remember really when I got into computing. At that point in li life, I was probably about 25, and I thought, well, I've got to really make 
some sort of change in my life and do something which creates for a future for me. And I had three different things I thought of doing. One was taking adventure uh, uh, holidays uh, around the world for people, and it'd be whitewater rafting down the Zambezi, uh, hiking to the base camp of the Himalayas or through the Annapurnas or something like that. The other, another one was to uh, be a social worker because I just always had that empathy, I suppose, to try and help people. And the third one, which was intuitive, was to get into computing. Mm. And at that stage, uh, you, you couldn't get access to computers. All the computers would cost many, many million dollars. But decided to go after the computing, did some aptitude tests, had a very high aptitude for it, then uh, set myself about uh, studying so I could uh, become a programmer. And that then led into my business career. Mm. And and that was a very successful business career, right? You started, was it two businesses and, and yeah, essentially... No. Yeah, no, I started uh, two businesses. The first one uh, ended up, uh, it was Software Professionals. It ended up getting publicly listed on uh, NASDAQ. Uh, and that would have been in the uh, 1980s. Then after that, I then uh, uh, decided to, uh, with the proceeds from that, decided to uh, start another company. That's called Integrated Research, and it's listed on the Australian Stock Exchange, publicly listed. And I'm still the chairman of that, and uh, it's been a very, very rewarding company. It's coming up for 30 years now, so mm. uh, it, it's a long stint, long <laughs> stint. Yeah. And... When did you start then to decide that you would take some of the the um, money essentially that you'd earned from the float of those companies and put it back into some charitable foundations and some charitable work? So it really predates that. It would have been about the 1990. I started to get involved and do some uh, yeah, charitable work at that stage. Uh, and then I just I slowly picked it up and then after publicly listing integrated research in 2001, what I did then was took a large sum of money and put it and actually established a foundation and put that into the foundation. And then the aim of that is it's invested, then we take the interest or 5% interest from the the charity of the foundation and then use that to fund projects in the developing world. So what we do is we take 5% of the corpus of the charity each year and give that away in developmental aid. And just mm. about all of it goes on uh, overseas aid, a little bit in Australia, but most of it's in the developing world. And we specifically specialise in the uh, Northeast Asia, Burma, Laos, Cambodia, and then also in the Eastern Central Africa. We do some, some work in other places as well, like Nepal, a little bit in India and such. And we do work in uh, Papua New Guinea as well. Mm. So tell us then about the Institute for Economics and Peace. So what, what's your mission there? What do you want to do? Well, the Institute for Economics and Peace, it was set up to understand the intersection between business, peace and economics. and places special emphasis on metrics to measure peace and then to ascribe an economic value to changes in peace. And so really, in a nutshell, what we're about is make, making peace tangible, and by that we mean measurable, and something which is achievable and of benefit to all of society. So that's really the vision of the Institute for Economics and Peace, but it really did spring out of a lot of my charitable work. So if we go back and we look at the charitable foundation, it works with the poorest of the poor. And so focusing on the poorest of the poor took me to a lot of the most uh, stressful places in the world. So sometimes into war zones, near post war zones and such. And I can remember I was once in a place called Northeast Kivu in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. It's one of the more violent places in the world. And I was walking through there. And I started to wonder what were the opposite of all these stressed out nations are spending time in, not with the most mm. nations. Search the internet and couldn't find a thing. And so that's how the Global Peace Index was born. But there's something very, very profound in that because of a simple businessman like myself can be walking through Africa and wonder what are the most peaceful nations in the world and it hasn't been done and how much do we actually know about peace? Not too much. You can't measure something can you truly understand it? And if you can't measure it, how do you know whether your actions are helping you or hindering you in achieving your aims? You don't. So 
that started me on a really big journey and I guess there's a whole entrepreneurial story in this as well, a bit like integrated research. So I'll try and maybe give a little bit of flavour flavor for just the entrepreneurial uh, uh, approach for this and just where it took me. So originally I've got the idea of, well, gee, if no one's done an a index ranking the nations of the world by their peacefulness, that's something I should do. So. From there, I contacted a number of the leading uh, 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 peace research uh, groups in the world, so I put myself on a trip around the world. None of them were doing anything like that, and they all thought it was a great idea. So at that point in time, I thought, okay, I'll do it. So at that point, I had a friend who, uh, uh, who was working for me, and he used to run the Economist Intelligence Unit in uh, uh, London. He said, well, the Economist Intelligence Unit's really good at uh, doing indexes. Why don't you see them? So at mm. that point, then I went over, saw them, and I already had in my mind the philosophy with which I wanted to develop this index and uh, the approach to it and such. So went over, shared the idea with them, uh, and they took it on as a piece of research, and they, that produced the first Global Peace Index. So at the time, it was just answering a question. But once we started to get the index and I looked at it, I thought, well, this is pretty good. So I thought, well, it's no point in me just doing an index and sitting on it. I should really uh, do something more. So at that stage, then I decided to hire a PR, PR company to advertise it and hired a company called Edelman's uh, based in London. So we then went a head and prepared to uh, do a press release around it and then a media campaign to see if we could get it picked up in the press. And at this stage all this was new. We had no idea how it would go, no idea. But what turned out to be, it was a, a, a phenomenal sensation in the media. Uh, that very first year we would have got nearly a billion media impressions and that's mm, a lot. That's, that's a lot. Yeah. And, uh, and so at that point, then, I realised, well, this is interesting. I've got something here which is good. And as I looked more and more, what I found was that we spent a lot of time actually studying violence when we actually think we're studying peace. Hmm. And the study of peace is something actually different than the study of violence. So if you want to maintain a highly peaceful society or have a society, let's say, which is resilient, what you do there is very different than stopping conflict. And so it would be a bit compared, so good analogies with health. So let's say if we went back and we looked, let's say, 50 years ago, great breakthroughs in pathology since then. Uh, none of us, neither of us will die of a heart attack young or even curing cancer. So the study of pathology is really, really important. But it wasn't until the, start, until the 80s, let's say, that we started to study healthy people to understand what we did, needed to do to stay healthy, like correct exercise, uh, uh, good thinking, uh, a good emotional disposition. And so none of these things you can actually find through studying someone on their deathbed. Mm. So to understand health, you have to understand healthy people. And societies are no different. If you want to understand healthy societies, study the healthy, not the weak. And I think that was a really, really major breakthrough in the uh, you know, logics of, and the thinking within uh, the Institute for Economics and Peace. But what yeah, was it, makes, it makes total sense, doesn't it? And yet it's so counterintuitive in terms of... Um, uh, I, it, brings me back to the thinking in NLP where, you know, there's this concept of away from and towards. So, you know, the studying unhealthy people or studying people on their deathbed to see how can you avoid that disease is away from studying violence to understand peace is away from as well. Exactly, exactly, exactly. And I think sort of the entrepreneurial journey was quite interesting because I pulled on a lot of the aspects which I developed in integrated research and it was quite fascinating. It was probably five years into it before I even realised it. It all happened subconsciously. So if we look at the computers, for example, and computer software, You've got stage releases. They build on what was done beforehand, and so it's incremental. 
uh, uh, and you have set defined releases with set defined sets of deliverables. And so I adopted a similar sort of a strategy in terms of the productizing of what we did inside IEP. So we have a whole range of products now which we bring out yearly. And so examples of that obviously is the Global Peace Index, which is the world's leading measure of global peacefulness. We have a terrorism index, a global terrorism index, which we produce annually, a positive peace report, which we produce annually, and we just keep improving the data into it each year, and the cost of violence to the global economy. And that's another report which gets used to, uh, really, really extensively. And so that's another report which we update each year. We've just now decided to move into the Sustainable Development Goal 16, which is the Peace and Justice Goal, and we'll be measuring that on an annual basis as well. So the idea of productising means then you start to sort of introduce a lot of the concepts you get out of the uh, your marketing or training, which come out of computer companies. So we put a lot of emphasis on being able to communicate really simply and really clearly. And so one of the things which separated from a lot of the academic work was one, we had a body of work which we kept building on, which meant we kept on reinforcing that brand name, which like the Global Peace Index or Global Terrorism Index. And then we'd also put a lot of energy into rather than uh, writing as academics would, to actually put it into clear and simple English so that sort of ordinary people could pick it up, read it and understand it. And I think that latter one had an awful lot to do with the uh, success of the Institute. Yeah, it had a real lot to do with the success of the Institute. Mm. Yeah, that's fascinating. I like the approach of, of productising things and, and using the analogy to business with uh, marketing and training, building products around that. Um, so what what's the objective of those indexes then? What do you specifically do with those and how do they make a difference? Sure. Well, it's a fairly complicated uh, answer because they all <laughs> in some shape, way or form. So the first thing is I think as a public good, just being able to measure the peacefulness of nations and being able to do it across a whole number of different uh, ranges is very, very good for uh, global discussions around peace. It's also very, very good for multi and use by multilaterals and many, many different governments to be able to get a better understanding of the state of peace inside nations, and that might be for the leadership of the nations, or it might be other countries which are looking at putting overseas development aid into those those countries, which are, a, a, let's say, lower on the index and gives a better idea of where and how to target it. Also, understanding the changes in peacefulness over time is a, uh, highly important because it gives a different narrative and view than what we'll get out of the media, which is the way mm. most people view peace. And just to give you an example of that, if we went back and we looked over the last decade, what you'll find is that uh, the world has become a, uh, less peaceful, about two, just over 2% less peaceful. And if we look at it, however, what we find is that 80 countries actually improved in peace, while 83 countries decreased in peace. So it's a lot finer balance than what you think. But more interestingly, if you look at the countries at the top of the index, you'll find that they've actually improved in peace over that decade, I bet slightly, where the bottom 10 countries in the world have actually massively deteriorated in peace. Mm. So, that's a, it's a, so the indexes can throw up all these kind of interesting things. Similarly, uh, if we look at the negatives in the index, and the, the three massive negatives, but everyone knows about it, battlefield deaths are up, staggering uh, you know, over 400%. If we look at the deaths from terrorism in that decade, we're up nearly 250%. And if we look at the refugee flows, they're now at about 67 million, which is the highest they've been since the Second World War. So it, we all know those facts, and they're really disturbing facts. But look at the counter side of it, what's the positive in terms of global peace? We'll find that 50% more countries decreased the levels of state-sponsored terror on their citizens and increased it. So there were less judicial, extrajudicial killings, torture, imprisonment without trial. Mm. 
Another thing which is lost on most people, and that may be rever in, the, in the process of reversing now, but over the last decade, uh, the percentage of GDP spent on the military has dropped dramatically, uh, uh, as has the number of the uh, soldiers and troops, as has the number of heavy weapons. So that's something else people don't realise, or that 67% of the countries in the world improved their uh, uh, homicide rates. So that'd be some of the kind of findings which you can glean out of one of these indexes, which is counterintuitive to the, to the, uh, the, the current the, uh, the global narrative, for example. Mm. Yeah, it's fascinating because I, I think I heard you say in a presentation somewhere that of those numbers that are going in the wrong direction, in the negative direction, um, the, they're really centred on the areas where you know, we all know through the media is are having great problems, you know, Middle East, um, Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, um, uh, perhaps Myanmar, Burma, and and if you take those out of the numbers, then the, the global picture actually looks a lot more positive. Yes, look, that's exactly right. In fact, if you took the Middle East out of the world in the last decade, it would have actually become more peaceful. Mm. And that's that's a, and so that says a, it's a testimony to a, just how poorly we've been able to manage those engagements in the Middle East. Yeah, yeah. And and like you said earlier about, you know, looking at um, some of those places that have changed dramatically in a positive way in the peace index and, you know, um, become more peaceful, what have they done? What's changed there to bring that positive change about and what can we learn from that? So occasionally I... Um, see a news report about some place, and I can't remember an example right now off the top of my head, but it's some place I hadn't heard of for a long time, and I see this news report about you know people going about their lives, about schools being built, about infrastructure being built, about um, the economy picking up and people having jobs and everybody being quite happy, and, and I'm thinking, oh, last time I saw something about that, they were in civil war or something. So, you know, what's happened in the meantime of those places and why don't we pay attention to that um, so that we can learn and apply that in other places? Well, one of the uh, probably most profound breakthrough I think we've had in the, the Institute for Economics and Peace has been the, uh, working on the uh, development of the concept called positive peace. So that the attitudes, institutions and structures which create and sustain peaceful societies. So we've been through and seeing we've got the Global Peace Index, this is another advantage of having the index. What we could do then is do statistical analysis against a whole range of indexes, data sets, attitudinal surveys. So we've got about 10,000 of them down here in Sydney. And from doing that, we were able to isolate uh, those factors which are most closely associated with highly peaceful societies, and we call that positive peace. And so this body of work is literally uh, the only body of work which takes a, 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 a empiric approach to looking at global peacefulness and trying to understand why. And so when we look at positive peace, it's creates we can take it that now and break it up into eight different pillars, if you like. So the things like well-functioning government, low levels of corruption, strong business environment, the free flow of information, good relationships with neighbours, high levels of human capital, acceptance of the rights of, of others, and an equitable distribution on resources. So none of those sound counterintuitive, but when you but they all come together. They work as a system. You need to have all of them functioning well because if you focus on one pillar, and two examples of it would be strong business environment or, or a high levels of human capital through education, if you just focus on them without improving the other pillars, you're more likely to lead to more violence. Hmm. So it's really important to understand how a society or the system of the society operates as a whole. I think that's one of the most profound insights which we've got coming out of the work we've done. But the positive piece then, as we start to look at it, 
and then look at a whole lot of other factors which are happening within societies and things which societies generally value, we find that positive peace also describes an environment where those things flourish as well. So examples of that would be countries which are improving in positive peace compared to countries which are decreasing in positive peace. On average, have 2% per annum higher GDP growth rates uh, uh, since 19. 96. So that, that that's stunning. Like that, that that's really a big difference. So positive mm. peace sets the right environment up for a wealth to flourish. We also find that countries which are high in positive peace perform better on measures of ecology. They perform better on measures of inclusiveness, including gender. They're much more resistant. So when hit with shocks, it's a lot easier for uh, countries with higher levels of positive peace to absorb those shocks and bounce back. And even when you're coming down to things like uh, genocides, let's say, we'll get back more into the violence. Genocides, high positive peace countries never have a genocide. In the period which we study, there were no uh, 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 violent political overthrows. In fact, political shocks were even very, very rare. And when we looked at civil resistance movements, there are a lot less civil resistance movements. They last for a shorter amount of time, more likely to be more modest in their, aim, in their aims, more likely to achieve their aims, and a far, far, far less violence. So as we looked it into more detail, what we found is that to a positive peace it describes a system uh, which is highly optimised to function. So it's just not that functioning as a byproduct that creates peace, which is where we started from, but also creates all these other things we think are important. Mm. I think one of the other things which came out of the Global Peace Index too, which we, which which at the time we didn't see, but these figures get quoted uh, regularly, even uh, we heard the uh, Secretary General of the UN now on many occasions quote these figures. That's the cost of violence to the global economy. So seeing we've got an index which covers 99.7% of the population of the world and uh, 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 we've got all these various metrics, we've developed a methodology by which we can ascribe a value to the cost of violence to the global economy, but it's aggregated up from all the various uh, countries, or the 163 countries we we cover. And so it's pretty staggering. Uh, so it's over $14 trillion in 2016, the cost of violence to the global economy. Mm. That's over, a, it's about 12.6% of GDP. And those numbers are conservative. In fact, they could even, even, it could even be higher because we can only count what we can count. We know there's a lot of stuff we can't count. But by having that disaggregated down by country and measured off 18 different dimensions, it gives the ability now to be able to go in and say, OK, well, if I was to do this intervention in this country, what's the likely cost? And if we improve the peace by X in these three different domains, what's the likely return? So it's powerful. It's powerful in terms of being able to start to look at violence and look at being able to how to, to looking at what the benefits might be from increases in peace. Hmm. Yeah, that's that's really fascinating work. Um, I'm interested in how how you use that now to influence decision makers, let's say, around tackling conflict and, and stopping conflict and not, you know, not getting involved in conflicts and not having this endless cycle of violence where um, you know, there's a violent act that triggers another violent act which then triggers more violent acts and so it's a never-ending spiral downwards into increasing violence. So I think this the work gets used in different ways in different settings, so it's, 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 so it's very, very hard just to come up with one thing that uh, catches all. But I'll, I'll give a couple of examples. So we've been working with the uh, Rotary International now for quite, quite a period of time, and they're about to roll out courses through their uh, 32,000 clubs around the world on positive peace. And what they've come to realise is that the various 
projects, they've got six different themes uh, in which they focus on around the world. What they've realised is that they're all subsets of peace and that peace can be a unifying theme for a lot of the work we're doing. So we're working with them on developing courses on positive peace, which then they'll roll out through their 32,000 clubs. There's recently a piece of the uh, legislation uh, which was, just went up before the uh, Congress in the US and uh, it's the, called the Violence, uh, 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 Foreign Violence Containment Act and it's, been, it's, a, the, it's a bipartisan bill uh, been put up by uh, the two senior members of the Republicans and Democrats on the Foreign Relations Committee. Uh, but it's basically based around uh, our concepts of a positive peace to actually look at how you go about reducing the prospects of future, uh, future conflict. Another way it gets used is in risk assessment. So if we looked at uh, the Global Peace Index and you look at the Global uh, the Positive Peace Index, you can do comparisons between the two because one gives you an idea of uh, what the actual peace is, that's the Global Peace Index, and the other is what the theoretical potential for peace is, so that's positive peace. So we find where a country is much more uh, peaceful than what it's, it, uh, in theory it should be, we tend to find that it falls back towards the mean over time. And that's a great way of being able to predict risk. So we can look at predicting risk where we basically uh, can uh, get uh, over 50 about 53 to 58 percent, depending on the model, accuracy seven years out in predicting countries which have high falls in peace. And that's as good as any of the models around the world can do. But that now gives the ability to be able to understand where you're most likely to get your failures within the future. Mm. All right. Well, that, I mean, I, I love that, you know, it is being picked up at a government level, particularly, you know, at a major government level and, and looked at what can we do to change this from the leaders of the country and also the Rotary Initiative for Training, I think, is fabulous because I think, you know, education around particularly this message of peace is actually good for everybody. It's not just, it's not just um, nice to live in and means people aren't killing one another. There's actually a whole range of other benefits to be had and, you know, people might think that if they let off a lot of rockets and you have to manufacture more rockets, that might be good for the economy, but that's actually not the case. It's better to be peaceful. So I like the... I like the idea that that education part is, is really being pushed there. So I think one of the things if we come back and we... So one of the things is we're not anti-military, uh, nor are we anti-police. So there are some violent criminals. They really do need to be locked mm. up, which is dangerous for societies. And then some nations live in uh, your, your dangerous neighbourhoods and need to protect themselves. But... The less money you spend on containing violence, the more money you've got to put into other productive means. And so we'll look at two examples. Let's say you didn't have to build a jail. So the money, which you'd say, you're not building the jail, you could easily move in to improving your re transport corridors, which would have a much more productive effect. So the jail is great, providing you're keeping uh, people off the street, but if you jailing more people than you need to or there are other mechanisms which should create a environment in which less people would commit crime then those productive savings are going somewhere more constructive because let's face it present guard doesn't produce anything they just make sure people don't get out of jail yeah that's right now, similar sort of thing with the military now you always do need an appropriate level of military compared to, to, to match the appropriate level of defence. But let's say you didn't have to build a frigate for $2 billion. You could direct that into uh, leading-edge innovation, which would drive the uh, uh, industries into the forefront of the next wave of technology, for example. You could do it to stimulate uh, uh, small businesses. Do it to cut tax, could use the money to cut taxes. So, or you could use the money into the education or the health systems. There's all sorts of things you can do with this money, but you build the frigate, 
you have to then uh, you man it, you have to sail it, you have to test it, and that all costs money, but it's not actually producing anything, is it? Mm. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, the only, the only production is the manufacturer of the uh, hardware to start with. Um, yeah, that's, I mean, I think that's a really good sort of lesson to apply and find that balance between, as you say, you know, not, there's always going to be a need, I think, unfortunately, but I think the reality is there's always going to be a need for military or prisons or, um, you know, police force and a level of violence to combat violent people. But if we can, yeah, if we can kind of get out of these cycles of kind of violence where, you know, I remember watching a news report once and I was just so horrified and, and it was in the height of, at, at the height of the Lebanon Civil War and all these little kids, you know, that normally in, in our society, the little kids would be running around the playground playing chasing and hide and seek and those sort of things and having a lot of fun. All these little kids were running around with um, toy guns and some of them actually had real machine guns and they interviewed some of them that were, seven to 10 or 14 year olds and said, you know, why, why are you doing that? And they said, well, there's nothing else to do. Yeah. Uh, well, society, yeah. Will up in, yeah, society will grow up in, isn't it? Yeah. Grow up in it's, it's, it's sad. It really, really is sad. But I think when we're looking at the world, there are some countries which are a lot more peaceful than other countries. They have a lot less people in jail. They have a much smaller militaries. If we can start to understand those kind of environments, hmm. what produces those highly peaceful environments and replicate that, the theory is over time we will develop a world which is more peaceful because it's a whole system which comes together which creates the psychology of a country which will be willing to go to war uh, for its own benefit or one which is only interested in its defence, or one which will then uh, undermine a, 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 a other countries for strategic interests, or ones which will be engaged in positive uh, a, a actions to try and improve the global peace. So if we start to now look at what are those aspects which create for a, a highly peaceful society, so that's back to what we describe as positive peace. Hmm. Yeah, and I love how you describe it as a total system. Um, so you know, the eight pillars of the positive peace and, and that it all works together as a system. So I think, you know, on, the, on that positive note, I, I'd like to move on to our buzz, which and, and I'd love you to bring in your experience from your, your um, business experience as well as the charities here um, but I think you know I could keep talking about the peace initiatives for for ages but I respect your time and also that of our listeners so we'll move on to the buzz which is our innovation round designed to help our audience who are primarily leaders and innovators in their field with some tips from your experience so I've got five questions initially and hopefully we'll get some really insightful answers from you well, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> so what's the number one thing anyone needs to do to be more innovative? Well, to be honest, I think it's based on innovations based on experience. You're pulling together a whole lot of different experience you've had to get a unique view of what other people can't see. And so for me, don't stop experiencing life and don't stop learning. So those two, for me, come to get, have been the real driving forces behind me and my innovation. Certainly, uh, 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 certainly, I think that experience, just experience as much of life as possible, really gives you all those unique insights which other and others may not be able to see. Mm. Yeah, that's great advice. And, and like you point out, it's your unique experiences and, and what you've learnt is different to anybody else's. So that is definitely unique. All right, what's the best thing you've done to develop new ideas or new products? I think one of the things which is, for me, is really, I think, when you get an idea or a good concept, is really try and work it up quickly. 
So you've got to work it up in a positive way. Uh, it's a bit like a baby. Uh, 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 You'd never really, uh, you get too rough with a baby because they're just so totally fragile. And ideas are like that. So you need to nurture the ideas early, work them up quickly before actually attacking them. So one of the things which is the people regularly do, regularly do, is work out the reasons why something's going to fail before mm. ever working out why it'll work. And again, that's back do what you want so you, you, before attacking it too hard, a healthy adolescent rather than a baby. <laughs> and yeah. I think there's, there's a lot around that which I think is working them up early. So the other thing too is in being positive about working them up, not thinking of too much. And you obviously got to keep in your head how they can fail, but without being overly focused on you, what how they fail. In other words, a can-do attitude. The other thing is sort of not, sit on the ideas and round them out too much. Get them out into the world and see how they, see how they stand. Uh, and the quicker you can do that, the quicker you get real-world feedback, which can then take you to another level. So that would that, be probably the two things which I see, from my angle anyway, in my life, which have been uh, most important in developing new ideas. Mm, that's great advice. I love the, love the analogy to the, the little baby and the nurturing philosophy so yeah instead of asking well, what can go wrong with this or what's wrong with this ask or well, what if it worked and then then look at the risks later on yeah yeah yeah, yeah. how do you how do you work the concept up hmm. all right um what's the what's your favorite tool or system for improving productivity and allowing you to be more innovative and particularly you know with everything that you've got on your plate and all you know the massive amount of work you get through well, actually, Jürgen, I'm a little bit of a Luddite here, mate. <laughs> in, in many ways, I don't actually have a favourite system for innovation, okay? I think really you, you, in small, on, and it's different as you're sort of getting getting bigger. So like, let's say the computing companies, Agile Development's really, 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 I'd say one of the, one of the better innovations in the last couple mm. of decades. Uh, uh, but when you're looking at smaller teams, uh, uh, I don't think there's any one system for innovation. The only thing I'd say is communication. So I think particularly in the your innovative smaller teams, the communication is the key to the innovation, keeping everyone on track, which then fuels over into the productivity and just really, really improves the productivity. But obviously, sort of through my life, there uh, have uh, been massive changes. I can always remember my grandmother. She was born before a, 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 a right flew an aeroplane and died after the first person had been landed on the moon. Mm. And I always wonder about that in her life. And in my life, I can remember I started work and the calculator hadn't been invented. So I guess that's the big change for me, an improvement in productivity. So I think the improvement in productivity doesn't come from one thing. It comes from a whole multiple range of things. And those things need to actually fit around personality because all our personalities are individual and different. See, so mm. things like LinkedIn, I'd never joined LinkedIn because I just think it'd be, it, I'd, I'd lose my productivity. I'd just have a whole lot of people chasing, chasing me down for money or business contacts for things I've no interest in. Now, there are a lot of other people I know who are a member of LinkedIn. It's, it's highly productive for them. It's a, a, a useful way of contacting people and finding out information on other people. So it's a, a, to some extent different for different audiences. Mm. Yeah. All right. Well, I mean, a lot of people have given a variety of answers there from, you know, software tools through to pen and paper and and other ideas. But as you say, it's highly personal. And yeah, the the rate of change is quite amazing, isn't it? So I remember going to school and we were doing logarithmic tables. And then when the slide rule came along, I thought that was absolutely fascinating. And now we've got um, a phone in our pocket that has the computing power of um, what in the early 70s took up probably the entire size of my house. Yeah, probably more actually, probably yeah. more. Remember, yeah. one, one, of, one of my experiences, I can remember really starting out as a computer programmer. 
and they had these uh, 20 megabyte removable discs which are about a half a meter across okay they, these are huge things huge yeah. okay? a little bit less maybe but they, they were big and then they went from 20 megabyte to 40 megabyte and we thought wow what a great technological advance <laughs> yeah. yeah that's right all right um so what's the best way to keep a project or a client on track uh well again uh I, look first thing is to having regular deliverables uh, and like mm. it but and it's the same for a client so it's so the same for your own internal projects you've really got to have regular deliverables which are feasible along a project path and you, you really got to focus on meeting those, each of those regular deliverables to keep it up to date now what happens when it, it, it goes it goes off track uh, uh, then one really needs to look at the re reasons why. The reasons of the can be can vary from uh, people slacking off uh, by going off and doing their own thing to the original project was too ambitious or there were some technical issues which one uh, discovered uh, late in the project. And then you see different disciplines to address different things. With clients, uh, I think the key thing is uh, keeping a integrity with them. Uh, like generally if they're you're falling behind or uh, you've got some technical issues and things like that as long as the clients are, uh, feel they've, uh, they trust the integrity of the organization especially the people they're dealing with then you can work your way through it so for me i, I always see uh, uh, ethics as being uh, in those kind of things and, and having a transparent and clear relationship with your clients absolutely key Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of that comes back to communication, which you mentioned before. Yeah, yeah. But then again, there are some uh, at times you do get clients who are uh, very, very, very difficult and really try and take advantage of uh, anything uh, which may go wrong. Uh, and that may be sort of trying to discount the project to the point uh, where it's unprofitable for you or uh, making uh, unrealistic uh, yeah, readings of the uh, terms and conditions of a contract and those kind of things. And those in those kind of situations where it's a uh, it's a just where the client sees it as a win lose situation. In those ca those cases, you have to be a lot tougher, and you don't want to be as transparent. Uh, uh, and you uh, yeah, yeah, you just really need to uh, yeah, draw a line in the sand and not cross it. Mm. So otherwise, you just keep getting uh, pushed back and back and back and back and back. Yeah, yeah, which might come back to setting boundaries early on, right? And which are part of the deliverables. Yeah, no, very much so. All right, what's the number one thing anyone can do to differentiate themselves? Uh, well, first thing, it starts with the idea, doesn't it? So mm. <laughs> there's nothing more clear as a differentiator than the idea. And so everything should be built around that. But it's always, if you're, quite often you'll have an idea and there's other people in the same space. So two ways you can do building, the two ways you can tackle this one is make sure your message is unique and clearly differentiated. So even if you can use words which other people are using within that marketplace, you avoid them so that you actually keep a clear message of differentiation. And peace would be like that for me. So originally, when they did the Global Peace Index, I'd go to Washington and people would say, you can't use the word peace. You can talk about security, talk mm. about human security, but everyone, when you talk about peace, they think you're some sort of left-wing... Uh, <laughs> uh, and for me, I thought the word was peace was really important, so I kept at it and at it and at it. And these days, the word peace has changed. Uh, yeah, people don't see it now being associated with the far left. They see it as being associated with moderate, rational, and uh, yeah, yeah, and deep ordinary day people. So that'd be that'd be that'd be one. The other thing too, in contradiction to that, and exactly the opposite, uh, you try and look at other words within a space which may help you, which other people understand, which may help you position your product once they're already 
familiar with. But to some extent, in doing that, you have to avoid coming just using uh, yeah, cliches all the time about uh, what a product does. But that's the other way of doing it. So the two are distinctly different approaches, but can be blended, can be blended. Mm. Mm, that's great advice. So I like the idea of you know, finding a unique voice, if you like, and but then using language that people can understand and relate to. Mm. All right, so how do you see the future for uh, the Global Peace Index for the Institute of Economics and, or for in Economics and Peace? How do you see that playing out going forward? Well, we're developing all the time. Uh, so we're getting a more and more momentum. The positive piece, we're putting a lot of work in. Systems thinking, which we didn't really cover too much in this interview, we're putting a lot of work into that because that's really a fundamentally different way of being able to perceive uh, yeah, how you run a nation or a country or a state. So those are the two areas we're moving into. But I think the thing which is really, uh, 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 really important really important is the future and sort of unless we have a world which is basically peaceful we'll never develop the levels of trust cooperation or inclusiveness necessary to solve these problems therefore I'd say peace is prerequisite for the survival of society as we know it in the 21st century and that in many ways is different than any other epoch in human history. In the past, peace may have been the domain of the altruistic, but in the 21st century, it's in everyone's interest. So, if I look at the future the, for, a, for, for IEP, or the business of IEP, it's really about trying to create a more peaceful world with at least the knowledge so that more people will know how to do that. Hmm. That's great, and, and you know, it would benefit the entire world population. So, yeah, I'd love to explore that uh, systems thinking and how to run a nation or a state on that uh, further, but we might save that for another podcast episode. Okay, that so, sounds good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what's your number one piece of advice you'd give to any business owner that wants to lead, be a leader in innovation and productivity? Uh, uh, so I think the first, really, I think a lot of time I believe in sort of the, a lot of this stuff advice being situational because it's different for different yeah, yeah. people in different fields what you want to do but the, I think the first the, the really simple things things like I've covered before is really make sure you have got a clear and differentiated idea uh, 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 make sure that what you're trying to do is drive your product or company uh, 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 to become the leader not yourself because see, uh, too many people will be caught up in the uh, desire for them to be a leader uh, uh, rather than the product or the company which they've created to be the leader. And it's a, yeah, it's a lot easier to write off the back of a very, very good product and a very, very good company than it is off your personal ego. Mm, mm, that's great advice. And I, I'm, sure that, um, I'm sure that that's something that... Um, a lot of people would benefit from following. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks, thanks, Steve. This has been really great. I've really enjoyed this. It's been a fascinating discussion on on something that we probably don't talk a lot about in this podcast, uh, but I think there's a lot of lessons here, both from an ethical and social point of view as well as business point of view. So where can people reach out to you and say thank you and also how can people become involved? Sure, look, so we've got a website called visionofhumanity.com, so people can fit, fit, fit us up there. Uh, if you go to Facebook or Twitter, we've got uh, handles there, which are under uh, Global Peace Index. So either of those ways, people people can uh, get in, get involved. Uh, we'll also train ambassadors, and we'll also be training a million, in the process of opening up a project to train a million people on positive peace. So at this stage, we've got uh, 400 different peace ambassadors, which represent us around the world. To be a peace ambassador, you need training in peace and conflict studies and a background in those kind of areas. Uh, but we're also going to be training a million uh, 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 people on positive peace. And that's a free online course, which we should be pushing out in the near future. So if you go to the visionofhumanity.com, 
or you go to a, a Global Peace Index on uh, Facebook or Twitter, you'll find be able to follow it and get information from there. Great. So we'll have links to all of that in the show notes underneath the right, yeah. blog post. Yeah. Excellent. All right. Finally then, Steve, who would you like me to interview on a future Innova Buzz podcast and why? Uh, Joe Stiglitz wouldn't be bad if you're into the economics of peace. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, Joe Stiglitz. <laughs> so you see, he's a noble economist at uh, uh, Columbia University. He uh, did a lot of work on the cost of violence to the uh, cost of the Iraq and Afghanistan war to the US economy. And it's also a, a, a world expert on the uh, measures of inequality and stuff like that, which he got his noble, noble economics prize for. All right, well, there, Joe, one. yeah. Okay, so keep an eye on your inbox. We'll send you an invitation courtesy of Steve Killerly. Okay, all the best. <laughs> yeah. All right, maybe we'll get an introduction from you. Yeah. Okay, thanks for sharing your time and, and your insights with us today on the Innova Buzz podcast, Steve. I've really enjoyed this, and I'm sure that the audience will get a lot from this as well. So I wish you all the best for the future of the Institute for Economics and Peace with um, the Global Peace Index and the other indexes you're running there and certainly in all that you're doing. It's it's a great uh, initiative all round, I think, and obviously benefits everyone because peace is in everyone's interest. Thanks a lot and let's keep in touch. Okay, thank you, Jürgen. I've enjoyed it very much and uh, yeah, see you again. Well, that certainly was thought-provoking and very inspirational. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Steve as much as I did. All the ideas and tips that Steve shared with us can be found at innovabiz.co forward slash Steve Killerlay. That is innovabiz.co forward slash S-T-E-V-E-K-I-L-L-E-L-E-A. All lowercase, or one word, innovabiz.co forward slash Steve Killerlay. You will also find contact information for getting in touch with Steve there, as well as links to the Institute's website, the Global Peace Index, and also the Vision for Humanity site, the Vision of Humanity site, where you can find ways to get involved. Steve suggested I interview Joe Stiglitz. Nobel Laureate in Economics, University Professor at Columbia University, and Chief Economist of the Roosevelt Institute on a future Innova Buzz podcast. So, Joe, keep an eye on your inbox for an invitation from us to the Innova Buzz podcast, courtesy of Steve Killerlay of the Institute for Economics and Peace. Stay connected. Head on over to iTunes or Stitcher or Pocket Casts and subscribe to the Innova Buzz podcast so you make sure you'll never miss another episode. We'd also love you to leave us a review because what you think matters. Take some of the ideas you've heard today and apply them in your business. Any thoughts, ideas, suggestions or questions, share them in the comments below the blog post. And remember... If you want to get better marketing results than you ever have, join our fantastic LinkedIn community at the Transformational Marketing Academy. All you have to do is go to innovabiz.co forward slash TMAC. It's free to join. Hope to see you there soon. Until next time, I'm Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz. Remember to be awesome and keep innovating.